Okay, you guys, it is 12.03. Should we go ahead and get started and then welcome others as they come in? Yep, oh, let's do it. Okay. All right, well, small group today, but thank, thank you everyone for coming. Um, uh, this is a pretty exciting time working on this project. If you, um, I think you all are in the right place. This is the Hidden Lake Dam Removal Neighborhood Meeting. Um, the purpose right now is really just for residents to learn more about this project um, and then uh, people to be able to express their concerns, ask questions, um, so we can get a good idea of um, how this design can work moving forward. I am Laura Ryder. I am the PM for the city. And um, please feel free to reach out and ask questions to me after this. Um, I also want to encourage everybody, if you haven't yet, to visit the website. We do have an online open house that's going on through today where you can also submit feedback and comments. Um, and today we're just going to give you a short presentation. And then we have some great experts here with our engineering team um, to answer questions. Um, if you guys want to introduce yourself really quickly, that would be great. Um, maybe Mark, you can start it off. Sure, my name is Mark Eubank. I am a project manager for the a consultant team who was working for the city on this project. So I'll, I'll be helping lead a bit of, of presentation of the project overview um, in a few minutes and have been working on this since about four years ago when we first got started in a, in a planning phase. So I've gotten quite familiar with a lot of the issues and I'm excited we're finally to this point in project development. Okay, I'll go next. Hi, I'm Kate Forrester. I am landscape architect and a biologist and have been looking at what happens to this space after we remove the dam and making sure that it becomes um, a beautiful amenity as well uh, with a lot of habitat and functional uplift for the site. So making sure that we improve the habitat and the scene, but also that we're careful about our placements of trees and, and how we restore this landscape for all the neighbors and, and, for, and for the wildlife that's there. So accomplishing all our goals. I can hop in next. I'm Valerie. I work on the uh, consultant team. I'm one of the design engineers that's been working on stream design and culvert design. Um, it's been a lot of fun working on figuring out a solution that we can get the stream through this technical area while working on uh, benefiting the habitat. So looking forward to continue working on this. I'm John Featherstone. I'm the surface water utility manager for the city. And this is a surface water project. So um, that's my current interest in the project. I was also the project manager for the city from 2016 until the end of 2019. So I'm helping provide Laura as the current PM with some of that sort of project background information. Great. Do we have? Oh, great, Lori. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, hi, I'm Lori Henrich. I'm with the City of Shoreline. I'm the administrative uh, and website support for the project and Laura's support as well. And Tom, Eric, Colin, or Erica, are, would any of you like to introduce yourselves and um, tell us if you're a neighbor or um, park user or you know your interest in the meeting and um yeah were your relationship to the site at all hello Hi. i'm colin um i'm just a neighbor park user all of the above uh i'm also a fisherman and i fish those shores as well so i'm super excited about this project i just moved to shoreline about a year ago and i stumbled across this website about a month ago so just kind of excited to see what happens and excited for volunteer opportunities in a couple of years Yay. Yeah, best of luck and excited to see what you guys have to say. Hi, I'm, I'm Tom, I'm Tara, I'm in, under Tom's name. Um, I'm a property owner just immediately downstream of the culvert that is set to be replaced. And so we're very interested in this project and how it will progress and how it will affect our land, our, our property and 
impact our, you know, our space um, and the effects of the change in the, the watershed and how that will impact the stream flow and erosion and all that stuff. So. I'm Eric Wall. I'm uh, a couple of houses down from Tara and Tom's house. And um, also I'm interested in um, kind of the downstream effects from the project and um, and would, uh, you know, I've, I've been following the developments for a number of years. I've been a property owner here for about 12 years. So um, uh, I'm interested to hear from, from all of you as to kind of what the plans are. I've read the website's really, really nifty and the, I've gone through the documents. They're far more technical than I'm um, able to uh, muster up, even if I, even if I magnify the maps, it's a bit challenging to to gather what you know downstream what the effects would be. So, um, so it'll be interesting to hear you and then respond to uh, our questions. So, thank you. I guess I'll go. Um, I'm Eric Bartlett. I am an administrative assistant with. Uh, the city of Shoreline. I actually work alongside Lori, but not on this project. So I'm just sitting in to learn more about this city project. And um, yeah, I live kind of nearby. So it's just all around interesting to learn more about it. Thank you so much, all of you. And if you want to Colin, I'm not sure what your last name is, but if you want to, you can, um, I don't know if you know how to change your name, but you can go up to the upper right hand corner over the place where your, your box is, and click on the dot dot dot, and it has a drop down menu to change your name. If you're willing to share your last name, we are keeping record of who's kind of here. So perfect. Thank you. <laughs> And then the last thing I'll add, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, thanks. Um, the last thing I'll share is that um, Mark and John are going to give a brief presentation to give you the background of the project and the status of where we're at. If you have questions while you're listening, please feel free to enter them in the chat, and we will try and address all of those afterwards. But you can also hold them and ask, just ask them after the presentation as well. So either works fine. And um, with that, I'll hand it over. Thank you, Kate. Okay. Mark, are you sharing? Yep. Yes. Here we okay. go. Okay. Right. Well, here we go. Take it away, John. All right. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Kate, for the introduction. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Again, I'm John Featherstone, the Surface Water Utility Manager, former PM for this project. And not only am I a city, a city employee, but I'm also a city resident. And I find myself down at Shoreview Park in Hidden Lake about once a week. So. Uh, it's one of my favorite spots. The the Bowen Creek uh, section of those parks is is beautiful, and I love going there. So it's it's been an interesting uh, intersection of life and work to get to work on this project. Uh, this graphic on this slide here shows a rendering of what we expect the current lake area to look like after this project has been completed and the establishment has had a little time. Uh, this would be looking at the dam face upstream in the current lake area. So I'm going to give about a five minute hopefully spiel about the history, some of the history with the lake in the background, just to sort of provide some of the context for the city's project. The original Hidden Lake was established roughly 100 years ago by the Boeing family back when all of that land, uh, including the community college, the Highlands neighborhood, the Ennis Arden neighborhood, was all part of the Boeing estate and it was their private trout pond stocked with exotic trout apparently. Um, that uh, was really prior to most of the development uh, citywide within Shoreline, the area that's now Shoreline, of course. Um, most of that development, uh, the single family residential neighborhoods that still characterize Shoreline to this day started in the 40s and 50s and continued on through the 60s and 70s. By the 60s, the uh, Aurora Corridor started to uh, really get uh, the sort of the developed to the state what you see today, especially the Aurora Square Center where Sears is and just large amounts of pavement and roofs and impervious areas that uh, the collective result of all this development upstream of Boeing Creek was to send a lot more water down during rainstorm events. And it started creating erosion problems within Boeing Creek. And it's no coincidence that around that same time was when 
the uh, Boeing, original Boeing pond promptly filled itself in with sediment. Um, and there were some failed efforts to restore the pond in the 70s. Um, there were some efforts in the 80s and 90s to provide better flow control for those flows coming down into Boeing Creek from uh, developed areas upstream. And um, by the 80s and 90s, Hidden Lake was completely gone. It, would, it was filled in with sediment and a sort of young forest. I believe probably alders were the species growing in that lake bed. Uh, so Hidden Lake was more or less completely gone by the, by the 90s. King County came in and put it back in 1995. Uh, which was the culmination of several efforts. Uh, they basically put in a new dam not far from the original Boeing Dam and dredged out the current lake bed area and promptly handed it over to the city of Shoreline because the city of Shoreline had incorporated around that same time in 1995. There were a couple of large sedimentation events early on where the lake basically had to be almost completely restored right after it went in thanks to that New Year's Day storm. Um, in 1997 uh, with the massive slope failure upstream. And from 2002 through 2013, the city repeatedly was maintaining this lake through, through dredging operations. And that's the only reason the lake really hadn't filled itself in earlier. Um, here's some aerials. Uh, I'll go kind of quickly through these. Uh, just they illustrate some of my talking points is that uh, from the establishment of the lake in the sort of 20s and the 30s and 40s, you could see that area around the lake was still really undeveloped and forested. 70s, you can see 1970, the lake was, the reason the lake doesn't look dark in that photo is because I think that's pretty much all sediment in that sort of lake bed area. And sure enough, by 1981, the lake starts to really disappear. And by 89, and especially 95, the lake is really not, you can't really discern it in the aerial because of those trees growing in the lake area. <clears throat> of course, 95 was when the county put it back and you can see the current lake configuration in those pictures from 2001 through 2013. And then it's of interest in that last picture in 2013, you can see that was the sediment in the forebay before the city did our most recent and final sediment removal in 2013. And that's actually kind of what the forebay looks like today if you're out there pretty much filled in. Uh, doesn't look too different from these pictures. These are actually past um, sedimentation events in the lake. Um, at least I think the, the left picture and the, the bottom sort of right picture are. But again, these look really similar to what you'd see if you're out there today. So the lake is continuing to deposit sediment and fill itself in. Uh, next slide, please. So since that last sediment removal in 2013, um, and Eric, thank you. I'll answer that question in a second. Um, so since 2014, the city has been working on figuring out how to deal with this lake problem so that we wouldn't necessarily have to go in and dredge it every couple of years. Um, and the, the, there was a management, a hidden lake management study done in 2014, I believe. Uh, at that point, the council decided to stop dredging and starting to develop options to remove the dam and try to restore this area to something what it was like prior to the, the Boeing Dam put in 100 years ago. And we've been um, developing this project in the years since. The uh, really refining the design is, is mainly what's happened over the last few years and progressing towards having our permitting and design ready pieces. We did add the culvert replacement piece at the downstream end of the dam uh, because those culverts are nearing the end of their functional lifespan and they create a vulnerability, uh, or I should say they have a vulnerability that will be, um, it'll still be there once the dam is gone. Um, so that's kind of the end of my background presentation from the last few years. Uh, I think Mark can speak more to that, but to answer your question, Eric, before I hand off to Mark, is um, that's a really good question, why the county put it back. Um, the best understanding that I have is at the time is that it was a legacy thing that folks who had lived here kind of grew up with that lake in the 50s and 60s and uh, thought it was something that was a legacy item that, that should be brought back. The um, technical justification for bringing it back was in, um, they used funding from the West Point uh, wastewater treatment plant that was put in near Discovery Park in Seattle 
as an environmental um, sort of habitat benefit type of project. And the thought was that the habitat of the lake would benefit waterfowl. Um, and I, I could potentially let the Herrera team speak more to that, but this is, uh, I think it's a concept that was iffy, um, potentially even at that time because you're damming a creek and um, damming a creek and calling it a habitat project is something that would never fly these days. Um, I'll add to that, John, the um, part of the justification in the documentation there, you know, that we don't have all of the county's files, but we've got some of it was trying to improve spawning conditions for salmon in the downstream reach of the creek closer to Puget Sound by reducing all the sediment load coming down the creek, basically, you know, recreate the lake, but make it a sediment trap that could be maintained to prevent smothering of spawning gravels farther down in the stream. Um, and the county, it, it just turns out they, they really underestimated how much sediment was coming down and would need to be removed for the lake to actually be a lake. And so the size of the sediment removal for bay that was in the county's recreated lake design was just not, not informed by enough, enough information. And so, you know, salmon have, have maybe benefited in the downstream part of the, the creek, but what we've also learned since then is forage fish spawning is, is a really important component for salmon recovery. And the dam, the recreation of the dam in the lake has basically starved the delta of sediment. So the Bowen Creek Delta in Puget Sound has shrunk over time and that's having an adverse effect on salmon. So as we've been going through the planning work in the last few years, we've been hearing from people in the, the salmon recovery arena for this geographic area have, have endorsed the idea of if we can get rid of this lake and let the sediment move on downstream through the system like it used to, even though it's, it's artificially increased some because erosion is continuing in Bowen Creek upstream of the Hidden Lake area, that it can be beneficial and shouldn't be you know, a, a, a real detriment to, to spawning that occurs. And there is spawning downstream in the, in the creek, kind of in the lower half mile of the creek. We've seen evidence of that. Um, chum, I think, is primarily what's spawning there. Maybe coho, um, but hopefully it can be, you know, as, as Chinook salmon recovery occurs and the delta can grow again, that we could see Chinook spawning in the lower part of the creek. All right, thank you, Mark. And I, that basically concludes my piece of this background presentation. I'll be available to answer questions later, but I think Mark, if you could uh, lead us into the some of the design, I'd appreciate it. Okay, so this is also just a brief run through and we, we can certainly discuss any questions you have after I, after I run through this. Uh, the plan as, as shown in this graphic here is two phases of the project. The first is to remove the dam, drain the lake and build a stream channel through the lake and that work is, is planned in 2022. Part of that work will include some trail improvements on the what's now Hidden Lake Loop Trail has a spur section that comes down. People use it to get to the northeast edge of the lake. That trail will be modified a bit, as I'll show in a moment, um, as part of the stream restoration in the lake bed to let people get closer to that restored stream. And a lot of planting through the site, which we'll also talk about, and then a couple years later, in 2024, come through and replace the culverts under Innisarden Way, continue the stream restoration through that new culvert crossing and replanting of, of disturbed areas that are um, cleared during construction for that phase of the project. And I'm just gonna give a brief run through in the, in the subsequent slides of what those parts of the project are gonna look like. So for dam removal and stream restoration in the lake area, I know this is, this is somewhat of a crowded graphic. This is a, a design plan that has all the components of the design on it. And I'll just step you through briefly each piece. First thing we need to do is the, the dam is roughly where shown, where this arrow is pointing to is, is remove the dam incrementally, um, slowly notch it down so there's not some just giant flood wave that gets released downstream, but have the construction contractor gradually dismantle the dam to drain the lake the dashed line around this graphic is roughly equates to the, the existing lakeshore, um, except in this northeast edge. And once the lake is drained, we can build a new stream channel through it. We'll, we'll put a lot of um, log structures into it, partly for 
um, keeping the stream in an alignment we want to keep it in, even though we don't want to artificially lock it in too much, but in, in some key areas, sort of constrain it by log structures. And otherwise, these are for habitat purposes. And the new stream or the new trail work over here, you can see this is the Hidden Lake Loop Trail here on the bottom of this graphic. And partway down the hill where it drops down to the existing lakeshore area, we'll pick it up with some modified um, trail components. There'll be boardwalk on some of this, this new trail over wetland areas. And it should be a nice you know, improvement to the, the trails that are in that area now. And a lot of planting on both sides of the stream um, of a range of plant types from wetland sort of plantings on up to a lot of trees. Um, we'll talk a bit more about trees later in, in the, the presentation here. The, the stream restoration through the lake area, what this slide is showing is, is a picture upstream of Hidden Lake, what the creek looks like, and farther downstream, closer to Puget Sound, what it looks like. And, and really this, this part of the creek, we're just looking for a transition that, that matches these kinds of characteristics and that have a gradual gradient to them so that fish um, can access the area. John, John mentioned before that a couple of years ago, the city council endorsed the idea of um, taking a look at fish passage downstream of the existing dam and could the city make some improvements there. The culverts under the road are a fish passage barrier. There are a couple of other dams across the creek farther downstream that the investigation we did revealed, you know, they're not so insurmountable to, to remove them, but they're on private land, difficult access. Um, it, it's gonna be an expensive challenge to remove those. But what we wanna do with this project is make nice salmon habitat in this area so that someday when fish passage is enabled all the way up into this area from Puget Sound, that we've got the right kind of habitat conditions that the salmon are gonna want. And that includes, um, gravel and cobble substrate, overhanging native vegetation, floodplain vegetation, a creek that's able to inundate its floodplain on occasion during bigger flows like a natural stream would, and, and really try to recreate all of that in the footprint of the existing lake bed. The culvert replacement part of this, these, these are a couple of pictures showing that the one on the left is the upstream side. These pipes with water gushing out of them um, emanate in a, in a big manhole structure. That's where all the lake flow exits today. And you can see the, the concrete head wall and these two older culverts that the flow enters um, in a big flood. It's a pretty exciting spot with roiling water there. On the downstream end, like I mentioned a moment ago, as you can see, if, if fish are trying to come into here from the pool at the outlet, they really are gonna be challenged to jump into either of these culverts and they would encounter really shallow high velocity flow coming out of them. And so this, this condition other than aging pipes is not good at all for fish. And what we'll replace that with is somewhat akin to this image on the left, uh, a much bigger, wider culvert structure, which is what we need to do these days um, to get permits for the project is meet the state's fish passage design guidelines, which call for much larger culverts that enable the natural width of the stream channel to pass all the way through the culvert. So a fish swimming through there wouldn't realize they're in a culvert because they're not banging off the side of a, of a concrete box structure or a metal structure. Um, it feels to fish and wildlife like, like a natural stream. And the, the picture here on the left is, is a similar type of culvert with a similar type of stream bed we would build here through it. But just envision that Northwest Innes Arden Way would have a taller fill embankment above it. Uh, the, the finished stream bed running through the new culvert is gonna be roughly 35 feet below the road. And that's a challenge. It's, it's, a, it's a deep, tight area where we're looking at, at replacing the existing culverts and, and putting this much bigger culvert structure in. So based on that design and the proposed work that's gonna be needed to put it in the ground, um, the city is obligated to go through uh, the State Environmental Policy Act review process, which involves producing a, a checklist document, which is, is thorough and addresses a lot of different kinds of issues. And some of them cover natural environments and a lot of them cover the built environment for you know, how people use this area. And it needs to address all the elements listed here adequately for you know, what, the, what the project existing conditions are and what the project may do to affect 
these natural and built environment conditions. So we've prepared that checklist and a summary of a few th key things that it finds in, in the documentation are for the natural environment, there's the obvious change of, of converting lake type habitat to stream and floodplain habitat, which really is gonna convert from habitat ducks like to habitat that, that fish naturally like and that terrestrial wildlife could make better use of um, with connectivity to those kind of habitats upstream in, in Boeing Creek Park and Shoreview Park. As I mentioned before, fish passage enabled from downstream of in Northwest Ennis Arden Way to the upstream end of what's currently Hidden Lake. Uh, we will be removing a, a fair number of trees that's, that's unavoidable to construct the improvements. A lot of those are clustered near um, Northwest Ennis Arden Way. And we, yet we replace them with a lot of trees in our, in our planting plan. Some of the built environment effects are related to traffic disruption during both phases of construction. The first phase won't need to, to close adjacent streets. There will be occasional flagger type traffic control as trucks come and go for the construction work. The second phase of construction where we replace the culvert will need a complete shutdown of Northwest Ennis Arden Way over the top of the Boeing Creek crossing for several months as we replace that, that culvert with traffic detouring into the neighborhood um, from the north and west. Construction noise that is that we will minimize to the extent we can with the kinds of equipment that are allowed to, to build the project. But like any big construction project, there will be that, that temporary noise in each phase of construction. After construction, improved trails through this area in Shoreview Park. And as the photo on the bottom right showing, this, this area has been a, a spot the city needs to spend a lot of maintenance attention and inspection attention during and after storms. And the intent is with that much bigger culvert structure and no longer in need to be managing sediment in this lake, it can be a natural area where the city doesn't need to be um, coming out here and, and expending city resources to manage this situation. So upcoming, we've got this SEPA review period. This slide is just briefly outlining what that's gonna entail. The city's Department of Planning and Community Development will issue officially the SEPA checklist coming up in a few weeks. The State Environmental Policy Act mandates a 30-day public comment period that'll extend into January. And whatever comments we may get on the SEPA checklist, the project team will, will review and address them and Planning and Community Development will issue an official SEPA determination by the end of January, which essentially is determining that you know, the, the, the effects of the project on the natural and built environment can be adequately mitigated through the design and perhaps additional features in the design if we need to based on comments we get. Or does the project have such extreme kinds of environmental impacts that it would need to be elevated to an environmental impact statement, which would be a, a much bigger document under the SEPA process. So comments that, that you may have on the SEPA checklist can be directed to Laura at the email address shown here. And as we approach that date, when the checklist is issued for public comment, there'll be more information on the project website about how to comment and where to, where to find the checklist. Lastly, this is the last slide, and then we'll jump into any questions there may be. Um, the project funding is coming largely from the city's surface water utility which John is the manager of. But we've also succeeded, the city has succeeded in getting some, some nice grants from three different sources. The, the King County Flood Control District has allocated some money um, in, a, in a flood reduction grant program. The Washington State Recreation and Conservation Office has provided funding in relation to trail improvements primarily, but also native habitat enhancement in a, in a park. And King County um, Department of Natural Resources has provided a waterworks grant to help contribute to the project funding. So it's, it's, it's definitely helpful that the city is able to get some outside funding to enable both phases of the project construction. And with that, we're ready to discuss any questions and comments that you may have. And I will stop the presentation there. Thank you, Mark. I noticed first too, we do have some questions and um, we also have a couple um, participants who join us. So welcome Jean and Justin. Um, 
So questions, one of the first ones that came up that we haven't addressed yet was from Eric Wall about, could you eventually address the feeder streams into the creek and any mitigation strategies to reduce or alter the feeder flows? So Eric, could you elaborate a little bit? Are you, are you talking about yeah, yeah, I the guess, lake area yes, or downstream? Sorry. No, I'm talking upstream. So it, in other words, um, there's obviously water that comes into this, the creek and because um, we wouldn't be talking about this otherwise. So then the, the question is really, um, it's upstream from the creek, upstream from the lake and, and the feeder, the feeder water into the, into the creek or into the lake, so to speak. Um, where does that come from? And is there any, has there been any strategies to look at reducing that flow before even addressing kind of the lake remote, the, the lake the project. Am I making sense? Yeah, yeah, and I can take a crack at that. Um, so the, the stream has two primary uh, water sources. One is the groundwater that feeds the stream year round and that's the low flow condition for the stream. Uh, and the stream's actually quite healthy in that regard. There's a, a pretty good amount of uh, groundwater seeps that enter this the creek mostly within Shoreview and Bowen Creek parks. The two, there are two tran channel branches, I guess what I'll refer to as the main channel, uh, which goes more towards the community college. And then there's the north channel, which goes up towards the uh, 175th. So um, the other input of course is, is stormwater. Um, and I think that's the, one of the, the main issues with the peak flows that we see in the creek, the very flashy urban flows that's typical of urban stormwater. Um, and a lot of that has gone back for decades since like when I was mentioning the original development of Aurora is a, is a large source of that. So the city did, we did look into the idea of providing a regional flow control facility um, for Bowen Creek flows for the flows that were coming down towards the Shoreview parking lot. And one of the things that we found was that there was not a, good, a really good place to put this uh, facility. We already have a facility at the M1 Dam and another facility at North Pond. And uh, to our best understanding, those facilities are operating to their maximum flow control capacity that they can at this time. Um, the Boeing, the regional facility that we were looking into planning, it's, it's just hard to find, as you could imagine, land and shoreline where we can put a stormwater pond. Most of the land has already been developed and it's expensive. Um, so what this means in uh, terms of how do we control that stormwater better going into um, Boeing Creek is uh, we can look, continue to look for opportunities to uh, install regional facilities. And that's something that on the city side of things we're going to continue doing. Um, but what will happen is that as properties redevelop and they, a lot of these properties that were originally developed in the 60s and 70s have no stormwater flow control at all on site now all properties of really any sort of significant size that redevelop have to put in on-site flow control. And so um, it's not a very fast uh, change process, but it's something that on the scale of the next few decades, as a lot of those properties continue to redevelop in the Aurora Corridor and elsewhere upstream in the Boeing Basin, we should see more flow control and that should start taking the top of that peak down. Um, but it will, be, it will be a gradual change. So John, I'm sorry to just pick on you for a second, but uh, the the Sears um, area on Aurora apparently was was there was a big change when that was put in, and 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 it looks like over time that property will be remodeled somewhat. So you, I guess what you're suggesting is that for a remodel to take place for that complex. Th they would have to address stormwater runoff at the time they do any re reconstruction or building in that area? Yes, and you are, that's a really great example of that, that huge sear site, which has just been the source of a lot of unchecked runoff will be redeveloping, or at least according to Merlot and Geyer, that's the, the, that's the developer for that site. Their plans are to sort of phase redevelopment, and so they'll be phasing in their, their stormwater controls. So that's one, uh, improvement to look forward to in the next few years. And the Alexa, that big apartment uh, building that's right. gone in, 
that you know they've put in stormwater controls there for those it's a smaller site than the Sears site but uh, those are a couple examples of uh, real world uh, changes that we that either are currently happening or will be happening in the next few years right thank you that was a good question thank you you know, related to that, I'll just add one more thing. There's a document posted on the, the project webpage. A feasibility study was done concluding in, in 2014 that was looking at, you know, what's what's the source of this sediment, you know, overwhelming sediment volume that can come down in big storm events into Hidden Lake? Is there, you know, what are the options for how to manage that? And that looked into what, you know, is it feasible potentially to do some things that would heal the erosion along Bowen Creek upstream of the lake or you know, greatly dial down the, 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 the peak flows that come during storm events in this developed drainage basin and concluded you know, decades out as development slowly happens and is subject to rigorous stormwater management requirements to basically manage runoff to a much more natural condition at the site scale until all that can slowly happen and, and certainly you know, redevelopment of Aurora Square would be a, a big step in that direction, but there's a lot of other older development in this basin that has no stormwater flow control on it. And it's going to take decades for that, you know, for the housing stock to turn over with new construction and commercial areas to get redeveloped to really make a big dent in, in the kind of flow rates that come down the creek. And given that reality, the sediment's going to keep coming for decades to come and the, the decision was made, you know, we can't try to spend a, a lot of money controlling stormwater flows and erosion in the creek upstream that might not even succeed. You know, it's, it's, it led to the decision of, well, let's just get rid of this big sediment trap that the lake has become and let the sediment move through this area on down to Puget Sound. Great. Um, Tom Wallace has a couple questions, and the first one that he had is, there are multiple barriers to fish passage downstream of the culvert. culvert. Why this huge culvert in the downstream area, if the downstream area will not be restored for salmon passage? That's a very good question, and I assume it's Tara under, under Tom's name. Um, the Sorry re, about the, that. Re, the, the reality is uh, the way projects like this are happening now in the, in, the, in the regulatory arena is a presumption that someday those barriers are going to be removed and let's not be you know building new barriers now and so to get permit approval from the state department of fish and wildlife we've got a couple um, native american tribes who are who are taking a close look at this project the, the snoqualmie tribe and the muckleshoot indian tribe and they pretty much will demand as part of the permitting process that you know you, you, you're not going to be able to build this project unless the new culvert under Northwest Indus Arden Way is built to current fish passage standards, so that it can reliably be not not a problem long term. And someday, and that day eventually will come. It's just a question of when do those downstream barriers you know either fail in a flood event or get taken out as part of a, a, a proactive salmon recovery type action that fish would be able to come through this project area and there wouldn't be something we've built in the next couple of years that is an expensive problem that needs to get rebuilt to enable fish passage. May I ask a question, a follow on question to that? Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yes, Jean, yes. go ahead. Thanks. So at this point, the sediment is coming down this, I live right across from Hidden Lake, so across the road from Hidden Lake. So the sediment is coming down and coming into Hidden Lake, but with this new arrangement, particularly with the wide culvert, that same sediment is going to go downstream. And isn't it going to back into the, the dams that you've got downstream before it gets to Puget Sound? And when that happens, what's going to happen with those dams? Will they be broken? And then I, I, have, I, can't, I, I can't envision exactly what's going to happen when you have massive amounts of silt coming down, not being trapped by Hidden Lake, but going into these, um, I think they're private dams that are in Bowen Creek farther down between the Hidden Lake and Puget Sound. Yes, so what we believe will be the, the fate of that is we've got survey information of the stream channel elevation 
you know, all, all the way through both of those dams. And what that indicates is they've already filled in with sediment behind them to the extent that they can. So any sediment that makes its way currently to the downstream side of Northwest Dennis Arden Way, if it doesn't deposit in the stream somewhere between the culvert outlets at Northwest Dennis Arden Way and where the dam is, it's just moving over the dam and on downstream in Bowen Creek. And we, we've seen evidence, we've, you know, some of our project team members and I think John was part of that excursion. Have crawled their way all the way through from you know, the, the railroad crossing down at the outlet of the creek up to Innes Arden Way, and seen places where there's evidence of, of what we'd call sediment starvation, where because sediment's getting trapped in the lake, the creek bed is eroding itself down, not right at these dam sites, but upstream or downstream of those dam sites. And the stream is cutting itself down because it doesn't have sediment supply coming with the flow to replace sediment that gets dislodged in turbulent flows during a flood event. And so what we're anticipating is with this project, and in particular, once the, the much bigger culvert is, is under Northwest Innes Arden Way, replacing what's there now, sediment will readily move on downstream of this project area and it can self heal some of those spots where the creek is, is eroding itself vertically down which should be of benefit to property owners along that length. So they don't have the, the creek, sort of the, the toe, of, you know, the bank at the toe of the slope getting undermined and the slope sort of creeping and, and falling into the creek, less of that. But in general, what we ought to be seeing is in, in the bigger flow events that come each winter, sediment that gets pushed downstream of Innes Arden Way gets pushed all the way out, almost all of it to Puget Sound. Did that answer your question, Jean? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I lived here, I think, 37 years, and we were in, involved in the uh, re restoration of Hidden Lake. So obviously we feel strongly about it, but really have a concern about the question that I just raised. Um, two other quick things about that. One is I've looked at the plans. I'm hoping that as you're showing this, you know, the, the creek going through and then you're showing areas of um, this is a nice way to put it, but muddy areas with small wood plants in them, that the area around the creek does not just turn into a, basically a mud field, mosquito breeder, etc. And then I'd also like someone to address the point if this culvert is 35 feet of, um, from the surface of the road down to the creek, that's a long distance and that's at the bottom of a fairly a long, steep, winding road, which is dark. We regularly collect uh, cars in the ditches, as you probably already know. And so I've got some concerns about, particularly at night, cars coming down in the Sardin Way, approaching that curve, which is quite steep, crossing this culvert, which is 35 with a 35 foot drop, and then moving on to the end of in the Sardin Way. Um, are there, and, and lots of lighting would not be something I suspect that the immediate neighbors would be really happy about. Are you designing this with guardrails or how are you planning to mitigate that problem? So the mud question and the curve question. How about if we go in order? Kate, you want to tackle the yes. what, what sort of vegetation and how mucky or not we're anticipating in the, in the lake area? Yes. Um, so for the mud question, um, the grading of the channel actually takes the water level down quite a bit. And then we're proposing using some of that material we're taking to excavate out the stream channel and resurface a little more naturally the lake bed that's been there. So there's not just this remnant sort of drop from the properties to a stream channel that there's a natural transition. And then within that, it's going to be very densely planted with native vegetation so that we can get um, the habitats that should be there, you know, so native shrubs and trees and ground covers um, established so that we can, one, not only have, you know, the, the habitat creation that we need to, but also compete with weeds and prevent exactly what you're saying, which is just having an exposed area that erodes or um, isn't covered. So pretty aggressive native revegetation on the site. And um, 
and then you know lots of trees but trees also placed in ways that they're trying to help frame where people's windows and and uh, patios are but also block views strategically somewhat of where trails are so that there's privacy maintained so that you know each of the residences that are there have a really nice experience when they're looking over the stream and then the people who come to use the trail also have their own sort of separate experience on the other side of the stream. Um, so I, first question is, I think, aggressive native revegetation. Mm -hmm. One thing Roy, I'll- Are you aware that there's um, quicksand in that area? That it's very, yeah, there's lots of wetlands. It's wetlands and lots of sediment and oh. mushy, yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's actual quicksand in a couple, at least a couple of places in that, in that uh, basin down just between the dailies and the pumping station. I just, I wanted to make a comment too. I'm sure you guys are aware, but vegetation takes a long time to grow. And when you plant native species, they're not gonna just be full shrubs and trees that will have good root structure and hold water and sediment. So, you know, there's, there's monthly high flow incidences between September and June around here at any time. And I just, what kind of things are in place during that regrowth period, both for the lake, for sediment control, for, you know, for people's views, for all of those components that take years to, to regrow. I can kind of address that a little bit in that what Mark was saying before, and sorry, sorry, Tara, that I <laughs> called you Tom again. It gets, threw me off again. Um, the while the the stream itself will be letting sediment travel through, right, and downstream. So that's that's one thing that we're anticipating from modeling. But then the banks and the shoreline are actually raised quite a bit higher, right, than they are now. So um, we're not anticipating from the modeling a lot of backwatering and engagement of, of all of those areas. There are some areas where we do want some of the water, um, especially on the park side, to engage and maintain some wetland conditions so that we don't lose wetland function in this area. But on the north side, um, near the other properties, it's raised quite a bit. And we're not expecting that to see a lot of water backing up and be as wet as it is now obviously it's not going to be a lake bed it's going to be raised and it's going to be more like a bench a forested shrub bench and yes it to does take time for plants to grow in um, so part of how you deal with that or we deal with that is you know the density of what we're putting in and planning a lot of things that are successional and uh, which means that they're going to transition and grow the things that grow rapidly you can put in first right so they can get established and sort of pave the way for the habitat to evolve or grow over time uh, so those are a couple of the strategies we use but you're right it's it's not a fast fast thing but you should see a pretty good difference you know well by the time your little one that i can hear in the background is still young so you should have some good coverage and a pretty hopefully really nice cover and, and Tara, I know you're sensitive to the south side of the road and vegetative buffer right, you know, very close to your house. And so we're, we're cognizant of that as we're designing the project of what can we do to aggressively revegetate that spot for the very concern that you're, you're raising. You know, with, with species that, you know, you're, you're agreeable with. They're, they're going to need to be native shrub and tree species for permitting purposes, but we could certainly sit down and chat with you about what your preferences may be for the aesthetics and specific tree placements. We've had some of that conversation with, with Scott Daly about, you know, there's a lot of frontage of, of that property on the southwest edge of the lake that's gonna be very different than it is now and what sort of vegetation can be a nice complement to what their views are and what vegetation they have growing on the property there. And we could do the same uh, with you. All right, okay, well, thank you. Well, there, I think they're not, there's not just that either. There's also the sound and the light aspect because as cars come down in the side of the way, the vegetation keeps us basically from hearing them constantly. And also 
block the light from their headlights. So I'm, I'm hoping somebody can also address the traffic question I asked. And going along with that, what happens with 167th? How does that branch off when you're building this additional structure? So first part of that, John, did you get that? First part of that was the safety of the shoulder. And yeah, and I will, I'll take a crack at this, but Laura and Mark, feel free to jump in. Um, so regarding the traffic safety element of it, the project is going to put back the same roadway that's there currently. Um, the major difference as far as the roadway portion of the project, other than putting back the, so it'll be the same curve. Um, it'll have wider, a wider shoulder um, on the, I think that's the west side, or is it the south side? I always, oh, southwest side, the downstream end. So there'll be a guardrail still. Uh, I believe we're going to put back the guardrail where there currently is one between the roadway and the lake. Uh, and there will be a wider shoulder on the other side. Um, we've had the, our city's traffic engineer reviewed this design and we will continue to work with uh, those reviewers as far as making sure that this is uh, a safe project traffic wise and it's also consistent with what we, how we practice traffic safety throughout the city. Um, and uh, let's see, there was another question. Oh, so that's the sort of permanent configuration and then there will be temporary impacts of course. So when this work is happening, in a certain way will be closed uh, where the culvert is being put in. So this will be the summer of 2024 is our current schedule. So we're still a few years away from that. But the culvert, uh, the excavation needed to install the culvert will close the roadway. I don't know if our, we have a sense of the duration. It would probably be, I would guess around three months. Um, and of course the access to 166 167th and 10th will need to come in from the um, 175th side of things rather than from sort of down in front of the college side of things for that three month closure. Mm -hmm. But there shouldn't be any long term impacts to um, accessing any of those uh, locations from the from the project. That's just sort of the during construction impact for the culverts. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark and so Laura. If you can if yeah, you go ahead, can Mark. see, I've got the an aerial, you know, a Google aerial called up. Can you all see that? Did I not yes. share my screen? No, we okay. got it. Yeah, I, I can see it. Um, so what John just mentioned that a few months of road closure during culvert replacement construction, a bit east of the intersection of Innisarden Way and 166th is where that closure will be, and and eastward uh, before getting up the hill towards uh, the community college. So uh, uh, trying to be as surgical as possible with how much of the road gets torn up to put that new culvert in here and traffic, you know, able to come access 167th and 166th from the north by 10th Avenue Northwest. And not needing, you know, construction contractor, there's gonna have to be some limits placed on, you know, what, what are they doing to stage their, you know, workers vehicles and equipment around this intersection so they're not clogging traffic in here for people that live down 166th. We're, we're definitely cognizant of that. Just to be clear, that means that for three months in 2020 to 24, all of the traffic that would come normally down in a certain way is gonna route around 175th and come down 10th Avenue Northwest, right? Yes. That is correct. Time to take an extended vacation. <laughs> It, yeah, it will be basically the reverse of when the city closed the 10th Northwest for that bridge work. Uh, I believe that was three, two or three summers ago, and it was probably a similar duration. So it'll be basically the the reverse of that closure. So we'll be putting traffic onto 10th that would have been on in a certain way. We liked having the bridge closed. It was lovely. <laughs> Kids are all out there playing with their bikes. <laughs> It was wonderful. <laughs> I, I do have to, unfortunately I have a, a conflict at one, so I have to jump off. I did want to look at Eric's question on the chat to address, make sure I was taking a crack at addressing that. Uh, so Eric, you asked about the water quality pre and post project, and this is something that I've been looking into a bit. This is why King County Waterworks provided some funding for this project because the lake 
is currently uh, has water quality issues. We had a, a beach closure at the lake that lasted for quite some time this summer because of high high counts of fecal bacteria. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, and we uh, have done some DNA testing actually to try to figure out what species that fecal bacteria comes from, and we concluded it was not human or dog. Um, there's no test actually available for waterfowl currently, but uh, once you rule out those other two sources, it's pretty much, uh, it's a pretty sure bet that it's the waterfowl. Um, so the main water quality parameters that, that removing the lake will help with are, is that fecal bacteria, uh, which is not what you want in your creeks, and also the temperature aspect. So the lake uh, during, you know, the sh this sort of big shallow lake is like a big pan. Uh, solar sort of solar heating the water on those summer days with this blowing it down and um, heating it up and that's also bad for for fish particularly salmon um, so removing the lake will remove this that source of fecal contamination as well as uh, the the sort of solar heating effect that the lake is providing we'll have a big channel that's shaded and so it'll improve the temperature effects of the water so those are the main parameters that we're looking for this project to improve. Thanks, Matt. Thank Maybe you, we could try and address um, Tara's question about, is there a geotech analysis of slope stability downstream of the culvert and plans to accommodate water flow and slope stability erosion for property owners? Yes, so I'll take a shot at answering that. Um, Tara, I think what, what we'll be doing after this meeting is, is providing some detailed info in response to your email the other day on, on these topics. And I'll just summarize what, we're, what we'll be able to provide is we do have a lot of geotechnical information, not so much right on the slope on the, the east side of your property, but enough information from up on the road and on the upstream side of the road to think we understand pretty well, you know, in, in geologic history, what's been going on out here, what's the nature of the subsurface materials, what function is all of that rock on the west side of the creek channel on your property doing. And um, in short, what the design is seeking to do is, is not remove almost all of that rock that is buttressing the slope below your, your house on the downstream side of the road. We're, as we're designing the culvert replacement, we're trying to be cognizant of keeping the length of the culvert as short as we can on the, on the downstream side. So the contractor doesn't need to disturb that rock ledge, essentially that's, that's down kind of between the creek channel and, and your backyard. And the hydraulic modeling that we have done is indicating to us that when, when floods come along, the lake really isn't holding up that water. There, there is no storage that the lake can, can essentially provide. The, the water level will rise maybe a foot in the lake during the course of a flood event, but the lake is not really able to slow down peak rates of flow in, in bigger flood events. So even though we, we will, will De definitely change the way flow moves from the upstream side of, of Northwest Innes Arden Way to the downstream side, the, the velocities and the depths of that water really aren't going to change as a result of the project. So that the potential for erosion on the properties downstream of, of the road, we don't think is, is something to be concerned about, but we know we need to keep talking about that and provide the proof in, in the kinds of analysis that we've done. And will furthermore not induce erosion on, on the banks of the creek along the properties downstream of the road by not disturbing them during construction. There'll be a, you know, a little bit of disturbance close to the road to get the new culvert structure in. And once it's in, it'll have durable, you know, large rock and compacted soil around it to not be a vulnerability. And as I mentioned before, particularly on the west side where all that large rock is that the county dumped some, some years back because the creek was eroding pretty badly um, at the downstream side of the culverts, leave that as it is. And then I could add also um, the latest plan iterations I've seen, Tara, have reduced the grading happening on that downstream side quite a bit, also reducing tree removal. And right now the planting that is happening there is really focused on that erosion control and like the, the quick growing stabilization um, native species. So that is really our goal is to make sure that that is held back in place and um, right now. So happy to talk with you about that more later if you want. 
Laura, do we want to say if there's any questions we missed? I mean, are we a hard stop or do we want to say if you'd like to email Laura, if there's anything else on your minds or you would like another meeting? Thank you so much for showing up. Uh, we appreciate the input and we'd be happy to answer more questions as you get them. You've got Laura's email address. Hopefully I placed it in the chat. Um, and the video of this whole presentation, I think, is going to be placed on the website, right? Yes, it will be. Great. So if you want to share it with other neighbors or other partners or other people who you know might be interested and have other questions or concerns, um, we'll make sure that you have this available. Yeah, we just want to reiterate that feel free to reach out, check out the website if you want to put in your email there. Um, we can send you a summary of the um, outreach that we've been doing uh, with this open house and meeting. Um, so please feel free to check out the website and reach out anytime. Um, and I just want to reiterate how thankful we are that everybody came. And um, we really appreciate um, your comments. And we hope that this is not the end of the conversation, but you can always continue to reach out and um, we'll continue to try to address your comments as you have. But thank you for being here and um, <laughs> Thanks, I appreciate everyone. it. So um, yep, have a great day, everyone. Yeah, have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Okay.